Warning, this video discusses topics that may be upsetting for some viewers. Themes of body dysmorphia, eating disorders, parental abuse, verbal and physical, and frank discussions of beauty, ugliness, and body size are in this video. If these topics are upsetting, you might wanna sit this video out and maybe watch this video instead. Ugliness. The London Review reasons that no man or woman has a right to be ugly. No man can love an ugly woman. No woman can love an ugly man. And if fathers and mothers can love an ugly child, it is a very sore struggle. And may be duty, after all, and not love. 1874, from The Methodist. I was researching something else and I found this story called The Ugly Little Girl in the Ladies Home Journal from 1891. The opening few lines of it just like blew my mind because they were so mean because they were just talking about this little girl who was ugly. Like that was the story. It was about this ugly little girl. And that sent me down a rabbit hole where I realized that our great grandmothers great, great, great grandmothers, and basically women from at least 1800, so the Regency era, up through like the 1950s, obsessed with ugly children. <laughs> they were completely wrapped up in the concept of having ugly children, <laughs> preventing ugly children, <laughs> shaming other ch ugly children, <laughs> and just completely wrapped up in this idea of having ugly children. <laughs> Like no wonder American women are so messed up, right? Like we have had over 200 years of generational trauma of mothers and fathers telling their children that they're ugly. Not like a regular mom, I'm a cool mom. We have slowly been processing and working through that like as a society. And while we're nowhere near finished with that process and we still have issues that I will be getting into and we deal with a lot of toxic crap today, it still is a vast improvement compared to where we were a hundred years ago. Do you stink? Do you smell bad? Do you wish to be refreshed? Well, luckily for you, Native is a sponsor of this week's video. And they have many anti-stinky things. Can you hold all that for me? Thank you so, thank you so much. Um, so, let's, here, no, you're hold, not holding it right. Can you just, I have loved Nita for years now. I've worked with them for years. They're a fantastic company. And they currently have their best sellers bundle, which is great because it's just a little bit of all the really, really good stuff. First in the bundle, you have, of course, their classic deodorant, which gives you 72 hours of odor protection. Comes in a ton of different scents, including one of the newest scents, which is blackberry and green tea. Ooh, that was really nice. Yeah. And it goes on nice and smooth. It's not sticky. It gives you a nice, clean, smooth, dry feeling texture. And it does a fantastic job making sure that you don't smell like stinky, stinky. And then in addition, my personal, like all time ultimate favorite native product, which is their body wash is also included in the best sellers bundle. I love this stuff. It's dye free, it's folate free. It also has citric acid for pH balance. It does a fantastic job in cleaning and making you feel clean. And then they have their latest product, which is the their spray deodorant slash body spray. It is actually an ozone friendly spray, but it is also paraben free and aluminum free. So it just helps you smell nice. So that way, if someone is around who's a little poo poo stinky caca, you can just go. But it also goes on really dry. It like dries instantly. It doesn't leave you feeling wet or sticky. It is just an instant drying, odor protecting spray. If you would like to give Native a try. Yes, you do. Of course you do. You can currently get their best sellers pack. Normally it's $39, but with my code, AbbyCox9, you get 33% off. So you'll be able to get the best sellers bundle for just $24. So with that, go ahead and use the link in my description below to go ahead and get 33% off the best sellers bundle. Again, using my code, AbbyCox9. Thank you so much to Native for sponsoring this video and to Nicole for putting up with my bullshit. Now let's get back to ugly children. The origin of pretty privilege. The culture of beauty is everywhere a legitimate art, but the beauty and adornment of the human form, the culture of personal beauty, and in our age, especially of female beauty, is of the first interest and importance. It is impossible to separate people from their looks. The Art of Beauty, 1878. Okay, so what is pretty privilege? It's a modern term that was coined and it's meant to describe, quote, the idea that people who are conventionally attractive based on current beauty standards have more advantages and opportunities compared to those deemed less attractive. It is also when people associate beauty with talent, intelligence, social success, and health. 
and let me tell you guys, Victorians loved pretty privilege. You're like really pretty. So while the term is new, the general concept is not. In the 18th century, it was deemed that one's outward appearance was a reflection of their interior self. And that's why having a neat and tidy appearance, having good hygiene, cleanliness, being fashionable, but not too fashionable, was really important to 18th century society. So obviously if you gave the appearance of being neat and tidy and well put together and not too fashionable, so not too vain, then that also meant that you were a good person who was then deemed worthy of love, happiness, and, and respect. By the Victorian and Edwardian eras though, this general concept changed ever so slightly. Well, yes, we did have an interest in the deeply problematic and generally just horrifically inaccurate pseudoscience of physiognomy, which if you don't know, is the concept that one's physical characteristics, the shape of your eyes, the, your nose, your mouth, like all of it, denote personality traits as well, was generally just abused and used as a tool of systemic racism, genocide, eugenics, all of it. It was a horrific thing. <laughs> However, when we see physiognomy used within the context of women's literature, whether it's women's magazines or books, and the literature is geared towards young women and mothers and daughters, it almost reads more like a personality quiz that you would find on BuzzFeed. In the book Obstetrics and Womanly Beauty for Every Lady from about 1895, based off of the cover, there's a part in the chapter of physiognomy that says this. Lips that are full red and pure with a cushioned appearance indicate a most affectionate and domestic nature and suggest a fondness for kisses and caresses. Lips that are thin, compressed with little blood, denote slight affection and indicate their possessor has ample decision and self-control, but is cold and rather unsocial. Yeah, it just, it, it gives very BuzzFeed vibes to me. Interestingly, we don't actually see physiognomy at play either um, when it comes to ugly girls showing up in short stories and literature in the 1800s and early 1900s either. Often the ugly child has a heart of gold, which may or may not result in them getting a husband at the end of the story, or at least maybe a friend, depending. Her behavior is no doubt a trauma response from her mother saying things to her like, how ugly that little one is. Is she not, William? And Mr. Moore, who was sitting in a rocking chair, amusing himself with poking the fire, laid down the tongs he held and gravely answered his wife, but my dear, you have already said so 100 times. And were you to say it 100 times more, Rose would not become any less ugly for you saying so. Rosanna was a little girl of about 14. She was their only child. And to do her mother justice, she was really very ugly. Nay, almost revolting with little gray eyes, a flat nose, a large mouth, thick protruding lips, red hair, and above all, a form remarkably awry. The ugly one, 1840, so mean. For our great-great-grandmothers though, pretty privilege was actually a result of the brutality of the world that they lived in, but also that they helped create and maintain and uphold. Beauty equals power. And if you were pretty, then you will have power. If you are ugly, you're screwed. Hopefully though, you have a great personality though, of being just a subservient doormat with the willingness to laugh so that way some man will just take pity on you and decide to marry you anyways. And then he can just torment you about it for the rest of your life. Why, returned the husband, I shall certainly go to paradise. It was my lot to have such a woman as you for my wife. I have borne it patiently. You will also go to paradise because I was given you and you are thankful. Now God himself has said by Muhammad that the patient and thankful are to be blessed in paradise. From the handsome man and the ugly wife. 1810, Ladies Weekly Miscellany. If a man ever said that to me, oh my God. From the first line of the book entitled Talks with Homely Girls on Health and Beauty from 1885, yes, that is the title of the book. The line is beauty, which is one of the greatest powers of the world. And when we're talking about a world in which women's rights, independence, and bodily autonomy are routinely denied and systematically oppressed, it helps explain why that phrase was so important and also why Victorian women and men were so obsessed with the concept of beauty and of being beautiful and of being pretty and of fearing ugliness and why it also would have such a lasting impact on our culture even today. 
So by being beautiful and actively utilizing the pretty privilege that existed in the Victorian era, it was one of the few ways that women were able to not only find a financial and social security in obtaining a good marriage, but also to be able to climb the social ladder and move up in social hierarchy that ugly women would not have had access to. By being able to secure a good marriage based off of your looks, then you would have been able to have also secured financial security and social security as well and comfort even maybe possibly a certain degree of independence, if you think about it. The other thing to keep in mind here is that in the 19th century is when we actually see the rise of women staying home and not working in the middle class and that becoming the ideal family dynamic. Because in previous centuries, that level of status of women not having to work and make money to per help with the family like income, that was only reserved for the highest of social classes, the gentry, the aristocracy, the nobility. It was not a part of the middle class unless you were extremely wealthy within the middle class. So I'm talking top, top tier echelon. But for most middle class families before the 1800s, women often either held their own jobs, worked alongside their husbands in their business, in their trade shops, running the trade, forming the trade work, or were even business owners in their own right. I know this might come as a shock to you, but honestly, in the 18th century, the middle class dynamics were more similar to ours today in a lot of ways, because let's be honest, this middle class that we're talking about of the 19th century up to the 1950s and 60s, that doesn't apply to us today. We can't do that anymore. It's impossible. With all that being said, and us understanding that the pretty privilege in the Victorian era was just one of the few ways that women could survive in this era. That doesn't mean that the publications around prettiness and beauty and ugliness are not completely and totally unhinged because <laughs> they were absolutely bonkers. From 1870 to 1874, Harper's Bazaar ran a column entitled The Ugly Girl Papers, which was just a slew of beauty, health, and like etiquette social tips. And the topics changed every publication. It was so popular though, that by the end of the columns run in 1874, they combined all of the columns from over that four to five year period and published them entirely in a book with titles like Hope for Homely People and Bread Paste and Court Plaster can to Conceal Your Wrinkles. And yes, I am very interested in exploring what that means. So we might, we might be visiting the Ugly Girl Papers again because whew, it was chock full of stuff, let me tell you. Now, while the Ugly Girl Papers was intended for young women reading the magazine and obviously young women with insecurities and preying on those insecurities, in the book Talks with Homely Girls on Health and Beauty, there was from 1885, there's actually a lot of sections that are geared towards mothers and how mothers can help ensure their daughter's beauty and to prevent their daughters from becoming ugly because genetics doesn't play into this. For example, they had advice like, the mother may cut, carefully, the eyelashes of sleeping infants using scissors with two blunted points, because we're not total animals here, and she will thus ensure long curled eyelashes by and by, because babies don't actually need those eyelashes to protect, you know, their delicate little baby eyes. It's more important that they grow long and pretty. It continues, every morning the wee nose should be carefully stroked between the finger and thumb to make it a good shape because baby's faces are apparently Play-Doh. And as the little girl grows older, her eyebrows may have a little coconut oil applied if they appear to be growing too thin and pale. Now, like, look, I'm not gonna knock the whole like coconut oil on the eyebrow thing because we like coconut oil, it's, like that's fine. But the nose, the nose thing and the eyelash thing, like bananas, bonkers. Out of, the, out of their minds, just, but like, that's not even like the worst thing that I've read. Like in a 1936 issue of Harper's Bazaar, and one of their tips is to literally hang the child by their neck so that way they can grow taller. So just strap that baby up by their neck, it's fine. Spinal damage, be damned. Guys, it's, whew. So what happens if all of this preventative work fails and you are, God forbid, cursed with an ugly child. Oh, oh no. Well, you would think that this would be the moment where ultimately good virtues and good personality characteristics really came out to shine for the Victorian era. And they, and they would have mother's moral of the story of like, it doesn't matter what you look like. Your appearance doesn't matter. It's what's inside that counts. It's putting people above your, I don't know, just stuff like that. And being like, it's not what you look like that matters. It's what's on the inside that counts. No, that is not how that worked. <laughs> 
Because they'd be like, well, at least you do have a good personality because you're still busted. What else do you have going for you? You're not pretty, so you better have a good personality to make up for it. You better be a nice person to make it up for it because if you're rude and ugly, there's the gutter. Just go lay in it. That's, that, that's all you got. Like, being nice is not gonna cure you of being ugly. It'll just make people tolerate you a little bit more. <clears throat> She had to her mother's sweet, friendly manners, so that as she grew older, people began to say that the ugly Miss Bashford was really a charming girl after all. So it was whispered, the little Bashford girl was a lot of fun, even if she was ugly. I guess that's okay. From the ugly little girl, which is the 1891 story from Lady's Home Journal that kind of started me down this rabbit hole, the story actually ends with Letty rescuing a little boy from drowning and her herself almost drowning in the process. And in the end, because of this huge act of heroism towards a little boy who also, by the way, was actively making fun of her for being ugly, the gentleman petted her most and actually spoke in admiration of her shapely head, her soft flaxen hair, and the promise of graceful symmetry in her slender figure. Cause that's not creepy that this little girl who was I believe somewhere around 10 years old in this story, the reward that she got for rescuing this little boy and putting her life on the line and almost dying while consistently being told by everyone, including her parents, that she was ugly, that she's now being praised by grown ass men for her looks and appearance. That summarizes it, doesn't it? That just kind of puts it all in a nice little package of, of weird and creepy and trauma. So when reading these articles, it becomes apparent that the little girl's appearance and her value and her attractiveness and her prettiness is not just a reflection of the daughter herself, but also the success of the mother in being a mother. Next to being beautiful herself, almost the nicest thing that can happen to a woman is to have a beautiful daughter all the bother of mothering a girl child up to her teens is repaid. When you begin to hear people whispering about her, isn't she lovely? Isn't she lovely? Isn't she wonderful? So when living in a patriarchal society where securing a good marriage is basically tantamount to a woman's success in life and social security and financial security in life and wealth and power and all of that. Honestly, this obsession with being pretty and mothers having pretty daughters makes sense. To be pretty was to be given a lifeline and for a mother to make sure her daughter is pretty, that was the best way she could protect her daughter or one of the best ways she could protect her daughter. And that was one of the best ways she could help her daughter within her society. Now we understand that that's messed up today, but back then it made sense because of the patriarchal shit stain of a society that they lived in that was cruel and mean. And it started so young. And this practice honestly continued up through the 1950s. From 1956, Good Housekeeping, quote, Daisy and I make almost a ritual of getting dressed for daddy. We like to hear him say, we look pretty. Back for seconds already, look at you. Are you really hungry or are you just bored? No, sweetie, don't eat all of mommy's 100 calorie packs, okay? No, don't give us any leftovers. We'll just eat them. From pretty to skinny, almond flavored trauma. So sometime in the mid 20th century, we do start to see this shift away from the obsession with being pretty. And we see magazines for teenage girls and, and parents steering away from this whole conversation about like, oh my God, don't have an ugly girl her life will be ruined. But it becomes more content that we would kind of recognize today of like, celebrate your unique features, how to play up your appearance, best eyeshadows for blue eyes. More about trying to celebrate your uniqueness of appearance versus just condemning it as, well, sorry, you're ugly. Ah! You know, I'm not saying that these articles still weren't problematic. It wasn't perfect. I'm not saying it was perfect because it definitely wasn't perfect, but it was definitely, there was a noted shift and a noted improvement in magazine cultures. Now, with that being said, it shifted. The fear of ugliness ended up shifting into something just as sinister. And it is the fear of fatness. Concerns over weight and being fat really kind of started to pick up in the 1910s and 1920s, which makes sense when we think about the clothing of the 19 teens and 20s. In 1997, the WHO established obesity as an epidemic, thus taking something that was like a more private 
vanity concerned and turning it into a disease that can kill and thus turning it into something that the public felt comfortable aggressively shaming people for. I think this Britney Spears performance was a really great barometer for how unhinged fat phobia was in the 2000s. Extra claimed that she was seen texting somebody immediately after her performances. Any any guesses on the nature of the text, Joel, and, and the recipient of the text? Well, I'm not sure, but I think we can rule out dietitian. All of this brings me to the almond mom phenomenon, which is basically our 21st century equivalent of the panicked, oh my God, what if my daughter is ugly, Victorian and Edwardian mom. And this phenomenon has been going viral on TikTok. It's actually been really healing to watch. A moment on the lips, a lifetime on the hips. It's not a diet, it's a lifestyle. And if you're not familiar, what an almond mom is, is it is a stereotypical middle-class American woman who imposes strong dietary restrictions on themselves, but also on their daughters out of the fear of being fat. And the term almond mom specifically, it, it's rooted in the phrase, if you're hungry, just eat a handful of almonds, which I think so many of us have heard in our lives. I think this is affecting me mentally Like long-term shit, it's gonna fuck with me I think that this is gonna fuck me up Okay, so while the almond mom stereotype began as just more general, just fat phobic, vain, like pursuit of skinniness concepts in the 90s and 2000s with bangers such as nothing tastes as good as skinny feels, we have actually now seen it evolve into something health conscious because basically society pushed back as a whole going, you can't fat shame people like that, like it's not right. So now these almond moms are more about health and being healthy. They only eat healthy foods and fuel their bodies. God forbid they eat something with red dye 40 in it or a french fry. They'll smell the chocolate bar, but they won't eat it. I'm so glad you're an adventurous eater. Move your body, but for fun, not to avoid getting fat. That's not what we're implying at all. My kids just love vegetables. I think it's because I fed them adventurously early. And I'm really glad about that because it means they probably won't get fat. Love and the thing is too, this kind of health idea and this pursuit of health, it ties into this sense of morality around body size. And that this idea that we see socially and medically that fat people are morally weaker, they are unable to control themselves, they lack willpower, and therefore are drains on society and burdens on society where thin people are better and morally superior, but are also better able to serve within the cogs of the wheels of capitalism. I want you to reread that last sentence and think about it. The moral value should be to be healthy. So someone that is less healthy has less moral value. If someone has an illness, cancer, any kind of chronic illness, their moral value is lower. If someone isn't working toward, you know, their version of healthy, whatever it might be, due to exhaustion, due to money, due to time, do they have lower moral value? I mean, it goes so far, guys, is we have that good personality trope that we talked about with like the ugly girls of the Victorian era. It's now applied entirely to fat people and fat women specifically. You know, oh, it's a shame she's so fat. She has a great personality. And that, you know, the fat friend is also the funny friend or she's the nice friend. And she's also the one who has had just years and years of trauma to make her a trauma responsive doormat for people because she has been told that she has been unworthy of love because of the size of her body. It is the exact same as ugly children and ugly girls. Your personality has to make up for your physical flaw or you're not welcomed in these certain social spaces. Like, of course, it's a great thing that we're no longer obsessed with having ugly children and, you know, telling children that they're ugly to their faces. At least I really fucking hope people aren't doing that anymore. And that we're not normalizing that sort of parental abuse towards children as just like, ha 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 ha, it's funny. It's not funny. But we're still festering this 200 year generational trauma. Pretty privilege still exists. It's still absolutely a thing. And if I'm being honest, I don't know if we'll ever really overcome this entirely as a society until we really dig down deep and look at the roots of pretty privilege and look at the roots of fat phobia and understand that they are intrinsically based in a patriarchal society where women's values are only connected to their physical appearance and their worthiness is only connected to their physical appearance.
our brains are so hardwired at this point, it's going to be difficult for us to break it entirely. The only thing that's different is just that our ideas of beauty have changed. But now, unfortunately, we also have to deal with the fat phobia expansion pack of pretty privilege and skinny privilege that didn't really exist in the Victorian era. So the Victorian eyelash mom has now evolved into the almond mom. Tell me you have an almond mom without telling me you have an almond mom. I'll go first. So it's the same sort of trauma, it's just marzipan flavored. Well, not marzipan because it's, it's, that's too much sugar. Harper's mom? Yeah, I heard you sent your daughter to the school with birthday cupcakes for the class and they had gluten and refined sugar in them. Yeah, just one question for you. Are you trying to poison them? And this doesn't even touch on the racist undertones and just overtones of our ancestors enforcing white Western beauty standards that still dominate society today. So where does this leave us? While I'm not gonna sit here and say that social media is perfect, it's not. It is obviously a hugely problematic place. It's still, we're still navigating it. There's issues with it. But I will say the thing about social media that I think has ultimately helped in this particular issue, there are so many creators of different looks and body types and ethnicities out there that there's literally someone for everyone. And we also now are collectively as a group coming together and discussing topics like this and saying, hey, this is messed up, like we shouldn't be doing this or joking about almond moms as a way to kind of collectively heal from it. Oh, we all went through this together. Oh, this isn't just a unique experience to me. This is There's something deeper and bigger going on. And yes, it's not perfect. Like I said, we have issues when it comes to beauty standards within Instagram and the Instagram influencer face, which is it's a whole other thing. Like it's not perfect. And so I'm hoping that by giving voice to the Victorian and Edwardian mothers who were obsessed with ugly children and how this permeated our culture for like 150 years, that it helps bring context and clarity to where we are today and help heal a little bit and move forward. So with that, I do hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did enjoy it, please give it a thumbs up. That does help the algorithm both for me and for you as the viewer. And if you haven't subscribed to my channel already, please go ahead and do so. I would love to have you here with me. And with that, thank you to my friends for helping me with this video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'll have links to like Nicole, Kaz, and Maggie's channel down in the description below. If you're not familiar with them, I assume you guys are at least familiar with some of them, but they're great. Thank you so much guys for helping me with this. And with that, I'll see you all back here next time with another video. Bye. Give me a hold. Oh, wait, no. <laughs> Donald Duck in it. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. <laughs> what? Oh my God, we're recording. <laughs> We probably could have chewed something out. <laughs> Let me see. <laughs> <laughs> That's gonna go gross. Yeah. I, <laughs> I feel like the worse the facial hair, the better, though. I yes. Get out of here, Grandpa. <laughs> Get out of here, Gramps. <laughs> That's like, no, my child. Don't touch me there. These are my Grandpa squares. squares. <laughs> <laughs> oh. mm. 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 Mm.